So let's say I say, name me a dinosaur to some random person on the street. What dinosaur will he say? Okay, you can't say that one. Something vague and awful will happen if he commits to that one. Ugh, not a dinosaur. Go again. Great initial answer. As is clearly demonstrated, Brontosaurus, the thunder lizard, the defining embodiment of dinosaurs as huge earth-shaking reptiles, is one of the first dinosaurs that nearly everyone can name. It was also fake. Yes, the original Brontosaurus, named by renowned paleontologist and walrus impersonator O.C. Marsh, was a case of mistaken identity. It turned out to be very similar to an earlier named Largsauropod dinosaur, Apatosaurus. As well, its signature boxy head was the mismatched skull of a Camarasaurus. Once this was pointed out, it was obvious the postcranial skeleton of Brontosaurus was nearly identical to Apatosaurus, thus discrediting the animal. One of the most famous dinosaurs in the world never even existed. It is merely a fluke of paleontology. If the mighty Brontosaurus can be considered, for all intents and purposes, a fake dinosaur, how many more obscure taxa have suffered the same fate? You don't have to look very far. Within a lot of even the most famous tributes to paleontology include some now defunct dinosaurs. Like here is one of the most famous paintings in paleoart, Leaping Laylaps, a wonderful early depiction of active, ferocious dinosaurs from a time where they were usually depicted as dumb and slow-witted. But what is a laylapse? The animal illustrated here was discovered by Marsh's rival, E.D. Cope. He discovered it digging around New Jersey in the 1800s, a sign of the many amazing dinosaurs that would surely come out of the East Coast afterwards. Laylaps was named after a dog of Greek mythology who always caught what it was hunting, a very cool name for a predatory dinosaur. Sadly, this taxon name was already taken by something even cooler, a flea. And thus, due to the archaic rules of nomenclature, the taken name had to be changed to Dryptosaurus. But the outdated name Laylap still lives on in the famous painting by Charles Knight. Another very famous Knight painting is this one of Agathomas, another fake dinosaur and E.D. Cope discovery. That's no coincidence, by the way. I alluded to them being rivals, but Cope and Marsh weren't just friendly competitors, but both lunatics psychotically hellbent on describing more species than the other, a grippingly weird moment in early paleontology known as the Bone Wars. Thus, both hastily named many species, Marsh with Brontosaurus and Cope with fragmentary Agathomas. It was originally just a set of vertebrae and a sacrum. With little to go off of, Cope described this animal as possibly being within the hadrosaur family, or duck-billed dinosaurs. However, after the very earliest descriptions of Triceratops was unveiled by Marsh, Cope realized Agathomas was within this new group of horned dinosaurs, along with other species he had described, like Polyonax and Monoclonius. So why, within the rich tapestry of ceratopsian diversity, are these species not brought up? Simply put, Cope species are non-diagnostic. The traits of the fossils are not specific enough to distinguish them from other named species. The sad part is, although this could be blamed on Cope's hasty descriptions, you could argue when they were discovered the bones were completely diagnostic. You see, when Cope first named Agathomas, which was described as the largest land animal ever when it was discovered, or the nose horn core of Monoclonius, these things were completely unique from everything that had come before in the young field of paleontology. But when more complete ceratopsian specimens are uncovered, suddenly these finds aren't very unique. Although their skulls vary widely, ceratopsian vertebrae are all very similar, thus it's hard to denote Agathomas as anything specific. Monoclonius's horn is damaged and eroded, its validity diminished further considering Cope mashed several unassociated individuals together to create the skeleton. With more complete ceratops and skeletons and skulls being dug up across the West, it ironically made these initial pioneers into the world of horned dinosaurs illegitimate. Oh, back to the painting. With little to go off of, Cope helped tonight fill in some of the missing pieces of Agathomas. The horns were based on the Monoclonius and Triceratops findings, but the spines and armor are actually from an armored ankylosaur, which were mistakenly assigned to Ceratopsians. 
It's easy now to mock this erroneous mismashing of creatures, but hey, speculation on what an animal looked like using its close relatives still happens a lot in paleo art. Besides, amalgamations like these are not restricted to illustrations. Chimera taxa are named after the mythical Greek monster of the same name, an abomination with a lion and goat's head with a serpent for a tail. Usually in science, they aren't this bad. We already saw one in the form of Brontosaurus, and within the sauropods, there's at least one other example. In the 1970s, a massive animal would be excavated within the famous Jurassic period beds of the Morrison Formation. This giant was Supersaurus, a dinosaur species that has stood the test of time. I'll be a, a bit of a bore if you ask me, a miniature 38 meters and 30 metric tons. But something was discovered in the very same quarry as this species, and it was an animal more super than Supersaurus. And what is better than super? Yes, Ultrasauros, a staple of many kids' dinosaur books from the 80s, 90s, and aughts. And no, that is not one of my many typos. It really was Soros with an O, unlike the usual U. This once more is caused by the ridiculous rules of taxonomic nomenclature. After informally calling the animal Ultrasaurus before its publishing, paleontologist and discoverer of the animal, James Jensen, had been beat to the punch by another official Ultrasaurus, described two years before he could publish his paper. This Korean dinosaur was not nearly as ultra, but once more it claimed the genus name first. Jensen, not one to give up naming his ultra lizard that easy, just switched out the vowels. Well, I keep alluding to it, but exactly how big is it? The holotype, the original fossil example of a species, was a massive dorsal vertebra, with additional vertebrae and a massive shoulder girdle assigned to the species. Those additional pieces indicated this animal was a Brachiosaurus relative, but even larger than its famous cousin. Jensen believed he had found the world's largest dinosaur, although in the papers I've seen refrains from giving actual numbers. Wikipedia gives a length of 30 meters and a weight of 70 metric tons or heavier, which would still put it in contention for the largest dinosaur ever, after four decades since it's been named. But sadly, this dinosaur and its awesome name was not to last. Remember Supersaurus? Well, the original holotype vertebrae of Ultrasaurus turned out to be just a Supersaurus. Those other parts were Brachiosaur bones. Thus, Ultrasaurus is not only invalid, but a chimera taxon. Thus goes one of the very largest dinosaurs. As well, the Korean Ultrasaurus, which was already described off very scant remains, is itself a dubious species. In a devastating loss, the global count of ultra lizards has fallen from 2 to 0 in just a few decades. But wait, what about the brachiosaur parts which were associated with the original Ultrasaurus vertebra? They have been assumed to be the species Brachiosaurus, but Jensen outlined several key differences in the bones of his finds and Brachiosaurus. So why didn't these stay their own thing? Well, the validity of the genus falls on that holotype vertebra. With its association with Supersaurus, the whole genus of Ultrasaurus collapses. These possibly extraordinary dinosaur bones are just left in a kind of limbo, hastily assigned to a dinosaur they might not belong to. Thanks again, taxonomic nomenclature. Before we look at some more fake dinosaurs, let me ask you something. Are you thirsty to learn about real dinosaurs? What about the other incredible prehistoric animals that are known in natural history? If you want to quench that thirst, check out a new YouTube channel called Life and the Earth. This channel will be dedicated to producing content about the many incredible places and times in paleontological history one documentary length episode at a time. Not only are they documentary length, but will have production that rivals anything else on the paleontology side of YouTube. But what about the writing? What if the writer's a total idiot? Well, the videos are all written and researched by yours truly. So yes, a total idiot. But I am using all four neurons in my head to write some of the best, most thorough and exhaustive content I can think up. 
As the head writer and researcher, I'm also surrounded by an amazing team of artists and editors working together to make these videos even better. So if you love learning about the real beasts of prehistory as much as you do the fake ones, I would highly recommend checking out Life and the Earth. Back to Ultrasauros, maybe I'm being a bit preachy. I've also seen the referred material labeled as indistinguishable from Brachiosaurus fossils, and dubiously labeling an animal as a new genus without sufficient evidence can lead to other cases of fake dinosauritis. Take for instance another dinosaur that I distinctly remember being labeled the largest land animal ever, Seismosaurus. Comparing this new dinosaur's fossils to another famed Morse information giant, Diplodocus, the paleontologist who unearthed Seismosaurus estimated it in the range of 39 to 50 meters, thus earning its awesome name, the Seismic Lizard, referring to its ability to shake the earth while it walks. As the massive skeleton continued to be prepared and studied, these outlandish size estimates came down to earth, and the distinctions between Seismosaurus and Diplodocus disappeared, until eventually Seismosaurus was dismissed as a separate genus entirely. Seismosaurus is now a species of Diplodocus, D. halorum, which from what I know is still the largest of the Diplodocus species. But alas, the earth-shaking lizard and yet another awesome dinosaur name disappears into phonedom. Back to chimeras, the Hell Creek Formation, situated at the end of the Cretaceous period, proves to be one of the most famous fossil formations in the world, which is well learned considering it possesses some of the most charismatic dinosaur taxa we know of. And there very well might have been a new addition as recently as 2015, the fabled Dakota Raptor. It was everything that was promised to us from Jurassic Park a massive man-sized dromaeosaur that lived in North America alongside Tyrannosaurus rex and Triceratops. How could this not be the coolest thing ever? Besides, it also answers a very important question about the Hell Creek ecosystem. For a long time, there had been an unnatural absence of any medium-sized predators in the bone beds. The Codoraptor fills that niche in perfectly. Maybe it was just too good to be true. The original Dakotoraptor skeleton was found disconnected and part of a bone bed including many other species. This led some to believe that these bones could have been unassociated with a giant dromaeosaur, and they were right. The wishbone of the animal turned out to be a part of a turtle shell, and there's much scrutiny over whether the other bones are in fact dromaeosaurid or just bones of close relatives. The teeth as well could in fact be from a smaller dromaeosaur. Oh well. These chimeras are all genuine mistakes, simple accidents that come with working on the often fragmentary and difficult remains of dinosaurs. But unfortunately, one of these fake dinosaurs has even been hoaxed, purposefully faked. The Liaoning province in China, for over two decades now, has been a hotbed of exquisite feathered dinosaurs, but also has a shady past. Fossils haven't always been dug up by paleontologists, but poor farmers milling around in the sediment, selling these fossils to eager buyers. So how do you get yourself a more expensive fossil? Creating one that would be a one-of-a-kind find if real. Enter Archaeoraptor, dubbed the missing link between dinosaur and bird, was in fact a literal amalgamation of dinosaur and bird fossils. I can't blame whatever poor farmer sold this to a collector. Business is business. I can blame the messy charade of paleontology that, after major academic journals backed out, got Archaeoraptor published in National Geographic, akin to announcing a AAA video game at your local GameStop. The fiesta was described as a tale of misguided secrecy and misplaced confidence, of rampant egos clashing, self-aggrandizement, wishful thinking, naive assumptions, human error, stubbornness, manipulation, back-buying, lying corruption, and, most of all, abysmal communication. Archaeoraptor was later mocked as the Piltdown Dinosaur, a reference to one of the most famous hoaxes in all of anthropological history, and itself a chimera specimen. A supposed missing link between ape and man found in 1910's England that was in fact just human and orangutan hashed together. Ironically, for how much of a dumpster fire it was, 
The dinosaur parts of this specimen turned out to be the four-winged dinosaur Microraptor, one of the more incredible species in the whole dinosaur record. If it wasn't obvious so far, paleontology can be messy. Look at Hell Creek. Remember that mid-sized predator problem? The other theory is that subadult Tyrannosaurus fill that niche, growing out of the environmental role as they reach their gargantuan size. But investigating these so-called juvenile T-Rex skeletons we have reveal they might be their own species. Enter Nanotyrannus, the pygmy rex. As an adult, it would have been dwarfed by Tyrannosaurus proper, but served as a ruthless killer of the smaller Hell Creek prey. That is, if it exists. A constant back and forth has existed about the possibility of Nanotyrannus fossils just being juvenile T-Rex fossils. In my opinion, the default view is that Nanotyrannus does not exist and isn't taken as an official thing. Despite this, a 2024 paper seems to give strong support that Nanotyrannus is a separate species, picking out many morphological differences between it and T-Rex, and pointing out that the supposedly juvenile specimens show signs of being fully grown animals. So just maybe this fake dinosaur will push itself into realdom. It wouldn't be the first time. The infamous Brontosaurus, maybe the most famous fake dinosaur, is real. After spending decades as the prime example of a fake dinosaur, the original specimen, without the wrong head, was reviewed with a modern eye and determined to have enough substantial differences from Apatosaurus to trepidly classify it as its own genus, thus resurrecting Brontosaurus. If there's anything to learn from this video, it's that paleontology is a weird field. It's hard not to think of dinosaurs as like living animals, but the evidence of these creatures come from fossils first, and thus are ruled by a set of some pretty arbitrary rules and a lot of odd history. But this also allows for the discovery of life and additions into natural history that no other field is able to do. In the end, these so-called fake dinosaurs are still essential pieces of history and knowledge for all the real dinosaurs we still adore. Thanks for watching. I was told that after my last video, which was quite gloomy, to make a funny episode preceding it, so I hope this lighter content fulfills that. I hope you all enjoyed. Thanks to Dara Hughes for the music. Thanks to the videos and images I used to help in the editing. Thank you for watching. See ya.